Well, good afternoon, friends, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Dave. Thank you, uh, Matt, for inviting me today. It's a real pleasure to be with you here at Mill Hill Chapel. And thank you, of course, to Professor Paul Rogers, who is as excellent as ever, and to Janet Fenton, who I've had the privilege of meeting on several occasions uh, at uh, similar events, both at home and abroad. Um, my friends, peace, as we know, is a global public good. According to the United Nations, the annual cost of war, purely in financial terms, was $10 trillion in 2016. Now, I think you'll agree this is an egregious and preventable waste of wealth and resources, and is, of course, also deeply unfortunate because peacekeeping and peace building can be very cost-effective policy tools compared to the costs of conflict, especially in the longer term. Now, by preserving an environment free of armed violence, prevention also minimizes the indirect costs of violence, including the diversion of resources towards military expenditures. Additionally, it minimizes the risk of international spillovers to neighboring countries and regions too, as well as the loss of physical and human capital. It is, of course, through peace that we're able to live, work, learn, and trade stably. Indeed, our own country, in our own country, we often take the benefits of peace uh, for granted. But what is peace building? So, in 2001, let me quote this to you, the United Nations Security Council defined peace building, I think, quite succinctly. It stated, peace building is aimed at preventing the outbreak recurrence or the continuation of armed conflict and therefore encompasses a wide range of political, developmental, humanitarian and human rights programs and mechanisms. This requires short-term and long-term actions tailored to address the particular needs of societies sliding into conflict or emerging from it. In other words, peace building is a mixture. It involves numerous, various different resources and competences. Peace building is long-term. It's no longer justifiable, if it ever was, to go into a conflict region, sort it out and immediately leave, as so many have done in the past. Peace is something that must be cared for and nurtured over a long period of time. Now, our notions of peace building need to move beyond post-conflict contexts that limit it to just maintaining peace in the short term, but must also enhance and preserve it. Yet there's so often a lack of greater authority to bring together more effectively the skills and the resources of not just governmental departments, but also civil society groups and other parties involved in peace building. It's with this in mind that we've begun in the Labour Party to formulate a new way of thinking about peace on a national level. We're fortunate that as a country we have so many unique strengths that can be harnessed to contribute towards peace and security globally. As a member of NATO, the G7, the G20, the Commonwealth, and of course one of the permanent five members of the Security Council, we're in an almost unique position to be able to promote influence and develop new policy on peace building. I'm delighted that this country is at the forefront on policies such as stopping climate change, abolishing the use of landmines and chemical weapons. We have one of the most outstanding and far-reaching diplomatic services globally, having representatives in 85% of the world's countries and at all major multilateral organisations. We're one of the few countries in the world to reach the 0.7% GDP target for spending on development aid. And, thank you, and globally, we are now the second largest aid donor in real terms. We therefore have the institutional capacity, I believe, to formulate, influence, and implement international strategies in order to promote peace. And indeed, I believe it's our duty to do so. We should use these resources and our influence to protect and strengthen the liberal values of human rights, democracy, poverty reduction, and global governance. When a country such as the United States retreats from its responsibilities, I believe it's up to us to make a stand. We must act and act now. Now, throughout, throughout the last 250 years, Britain has exported institutions of effective governance and the rule of law throughout the globe, perhaps not in the way we might have liked. Its political institutions were the inspiration for many countries and still are. Our government, in considering our future role in the world post-Brexit, seems far too preoccupied at the moment with trade, and indeed trade, quite often with some nefarious regimes. 
we believe in the Labour Party that to protect our people and our values at home, we must ensure that we create an environment globally that secures and enhances peace. And that we must lead by example. Peacemaking should be a fundamental aspect of political decision making, since it affects so many corners of society and so many government departments. Clearly, a new vehicle for peace is needed that understands the world we live in today, one that supports the increasing global demand for more effective, efficient policies to support peace and security. Because we will only achieve security through peace. So all this forms the foundations for Labour's peace doctrine. Surprise, I'm talking about that. Um, sustaining peace, we believe, is a shared responsibility that involves work in prevention, peacekeeping, post-conflict recovery, reconstruction, and of course, institution building. It will involve multiple agencies and departments working more closely with one another in a deeper, more consultative pro process than we have ever experienced before. Sustaining peace, also requires fully into a fully integrated approach, and not just the strategic, but also the policy-making and operational level. The peace doctrine envisages bringing together resources from all of the externally facing departments, external facing departments within government. It will be an adaptable and transferable document. It will bring together various departments of state, including the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Defence, Department for International Development, International Trade, and the British Council, among others, and fundamentally overhaul how we as a country go about responding to conflict and our capacities and approaches to building and maintaining peace. As our first Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament, I already work between different departments, and I'm a member of the Shadow Foreign Office team as well as the Shadow Defence team. The Peace Doctrine envisages a role for a Minister of Peace and Disarmament, which will be needed for each specific, sorry, that will be, peace, sorry, let me start again. The Peace Doctrine envisages a role for, the, for a minister for peace and disarmament that could highlight what resources from each department will be needed for each specific issue. There's still a lack, as we know, of joined up thinking between government departments concerning peace building, where a silo mentality still prevails. Furthermore, there's also a lack of joined up thinking and action between the government itself and the non-governmental organisations that are so crucial to the success of this policy. It's also a role that envisages an integrated service that's not only reactive to crises, but also involves long-term projects to prevent further crises from happening in the first place. Now, governments already spend vast resources on predicting changes in the economy through statistical predictions and theoretical projections. These often determine how resources are used and where money is spent. A similar position could be taken in relation to peace and security. Governments should be able to do more to predict future crises that can affect peace and security just as they do on the economy. There should be annual statements and reviews on government policy in relation to peace made every year to Parliament. Now I have the deepest respect for many members of the military who are often the first responders in a crisis situation. Our brave men and women have proven adept in their actions to crises around the world, and they're renowned globally for their excellent training, their incorruptibility, their professionalism and expertise. What the peace doctrine proposes is a larger, more efficient, faster humanitarian response capability that will be able to be deployed in the event of natural and man-made disasters. We should see our military not just as defenders of the realm, not just first responders to a crisis situation, but as a professional, highly regimented and adaptable force that is ready to prevent a crisis from happening in the first place. Indeed, the UK armed forces need to move from a reactive posture, dealing with crises after they've started, towards a more proactive role in preventing future crises. We see our armed forces being the physical backbone of this integrated approach. A peace doctrine will go beyond the traditional aid budget system uh, as a means of promoting development in regions with weak institutions that are prone to conflict. There is a greater need, I believe and we believe, to integrate peace impact into development and humanitarian programs, especially in fragile states. In conjunction with the FCO, there would be an increase in preventative diplomatic strategy. And the peace doctrine moves beyond 
the three main departments of DFID, FCO and Defence, and sees possibilities for greater coordination amongst other organs of the state and, of course, amongst wider society. We now live in a far more connected world. There are more spaces to connect to people and for them to be more engaged with vital issues. Today's social and conventional media open up new opportunities to support peace and security globally by providing people with essential information. In Sierra Leone, for example, it was community radio that aided the consolidation of peace and in that country, uh, in, and in that country over the last 15 years. We are blessed with having the world's greatest and largest international broadcaster in the BBC, broadcasting in almost 50 languages. It has a global audience now of over 201 million people and counting. It reaches some of the most remote places on earth, and as part of its global mission to educate and, and inform, the BBC plays a crucial role in disseminating the factual information that helps to protect peace in potential conflict zones and to save lives in times of crisis educating people on issues ranging from women's rights to climate change. A Labour government will ensure, will both encourage that role and just as importantly ensure that it is properly funded. Within Britain's world-renowned universities, we're also deeply fortunate to have some of the world's best departments in war studies and peace studies in King's College London and of course next door to us at the University of Bradford. Thank you, Paul. The peace doctrine would learn, would learn uh, from the very best in the research and analysis being conducted by these universities and ask those departments to help us create better tools to monitor new trends in peace building as well as helping to train our civil servants and military personnel in peace building policy. And Dave, finally, the peace doctrine will involve you. The peace doctrine is an inclusive, consultative and deliberative document. It is something we feel would benefit from the input from individuals and from civil society. For peace building is a consultative process that works best when all members with a stake in it are involved. So let's work together to fight the challenges we face as a human race. Let us combine our resources and work for a better future for all living creatures on this unique planet Earth because I strongly believe that when we work together we can achieve extraordinary things. We can overcome the threats that affect us as a global community and we can create a better future for ourselves and our children. To conclude, I'm reminded of something the great philosopher Bertrand Russell once said. The only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. That has never been more appropriate than it is today.